Let me know. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Michaela. That's grand. I keep quiet, will you? Uh, Good morning, everyone. It is so, so good to be with you this morning. I want to say a couple of things before we get going here today. And this uh, it's just a couple of things. One, it is fantastic to have the whole church back together. It is... Uh, we ha- I don't know, I can't remember, I genuinely can't remember the last time the whole church was together, and it is an amazing thing to have that today. That's the first thing. Second thing is, it's pretty weird that we are standing in Ivey Park in North Island. Like, for any of us who played here over the years, or, well, played might be an exaggeration for me, but w- was on this pitch, like, and there's, so, there's a few of us around this t- this morning who were here, Never in all my days did I imagine that we would have a worship service here. Never. And it is a pretty amazing thing to be here this morning, worshipping God in this place. And so it's just an amazing, weird sort of day. And I hope that you're blessed. If you're, if you're visiting with us, my name's John. Uh, I am an elder in Cornerstone. And we, over the last few weeks, we've been doing a, a mini-series mini in, in Second Peter. Uh, just a three-week series in Second Peter, and today we're finishing that series out. And really, uh, last week I said last week we looked at false teachers and and heresy and all those things. And I said this week would be a bit of a chip, more chipper week. But just uh, listening to that passage again through from Ali, I was like, I sort of lied. Uh, like wrath being stored up there and hell and and, and and like the waters flooding the earth and all that. I was like. Not sure where I'm going to get the chipperness out of this, really, but I'll try my best. And I will try to be a bit shorter today because I know you're looking forward to a barbecue and just some crack. But after chapter 2 in Second Peter, the issue in, 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 in Second Peter chapter 2 was false teaching and heresy. And what that, and then you move into, into chapter 3 and, and you sort of get an idea of what that false teaching and what that heresy was. And it was this. People were saying that Jesus wasn't going to return. False teachers had come in and they were saying that because of the delay in in Jesus apparently returning, they were saying that he's not going to come back at all. That's the heresy. That's the false teaching that had crept in to the church. Now, you know and I know delays are annoying. Any delay is annoying. While you're waiting on a flight and it's delayed, while you're waiting on a parcel coming from Amazon, uh, Gail Graham doesn't have that problem because there's one comes every day. Uh, and it's just what it is, this will be, it will be the issue. But delays conjure up frustration. Delays conjure up frustration. And it seems as if in, 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 in Second Peter that's the issue. There was a frustration creeping into the church about Jesus' return. There were people starting to get anxious about Jesus return maybe Jesus isn't really coming back after all where are these so-called promises being fulfilled and what Peter wants to do is to reassure the people that that is just not true and that Jesus will return and he wants to give them reassurance And, and, and how he does this is that he points them to the word that's how he does it. He points them to the word. We see it here in verse 1 to 3. And he says this. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere, your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through the apostles. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, even though these false teachers have come in, even though they're saying that Jesus isn't returned, I want to focus your mind on the word. Look at the prophets. Look at what they said. Look at how these things have been fulfilled. And what he's saying here when he says about the the, the word of the apostles, what what he's saying to us is basically that's our New Testament. I want you to look at the word and I want your expectations of what is going to happen to be shaped through the word. Not what these false teachers are telling you. And in verse 2, you get to see what he wants them to hear in particular. That you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Sometimes when theological controversy or strife or trouble arise, it can blow us off course. 
we can wonder what God is doing. Sometimes even in the church when strife arises or trouble arises or theological controversy arises, we can wonder what God's doing. What's happening? Peter wants to remind his listeners back then, there and then, and the here and now, fix your attention on the word. Peter wants us to remember that the word of God is our rule of faith. We focus on the word. We're not to follow personalities. Sometimes the issue is that, that uh, I'd imagine this was the case when Peter was writing to the early church, that sometimes personalities are, 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 can take center stage and, and, and we, we, we listen to certain people because of the way that they are. Peter says, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Listen to the word of God. Focus on the word of God. And as I say, sometimes we can get blown off course because we, our expectations are on people rather than the word. Peter says, don't be surprised when false teachers come. Don't be surprised when strife happens. Focus on the word. God is at work. I don't know about you, and I know some of you are listening to stuff at the moment, podcasts, the particular one about Mars Hill. And, and the rise and fall of Mars Hill, I would highly recommend that you, you listen to it, actually. But if you listen to that and you let that inform what you thought of the church, then you could be blown off course very, very quickly. Peter says, no, 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 no. Don't look at churches. Don't look at people. Look to the Word of God. And that's what he wants to remind these people of. Look to the Word. The Word should form our expectations of what will happen. But then he goes on to talk about these false teachers again. And he says, I'll just read it here. He says, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers, verse 3, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. You see, the problem was they were pointing. Some, of the, some people in the church had died. The first generation had begun to die and Jesus hadn't returned. And so these the church were saying, look, things are as they always were. Nothing has changed. Where is Jesus? Why has he not returned? And Peter says, what they have done in saying, where is Jesus? Why has he not returned? These scoffers who have come into the church, what they have done is overlooked the fact that the word of God has always governed throughout all of history. The word of God has always governed throughout history. Look at what he says. They have, he says, these guys have deliberately overlooked the pattern of history. They have deliberately overlooked this fact. And then he goes through this. They have deliberately overlooked the fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and through the water by the word of God. And that means, and by that means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Peter said, look back. Look back at history. The word of God has governed every single thing that has ever happened. How did, how did creation come into being? Through the word. The word has governed every single thing that has happened. And Peter again is pointing them back and saying, don't be thrown off course. Don't take your eyes off this. Look to the word. As I said, part of the presumably the problem was presumably these teachers saying that Jesus wasn't coming back. And part of the problem with Jesus not coming back is this. If Jesus isn't coming back, fill your boots up. Do what you want. Eat, drink, and be merry. Because there's no consequences. And Peter says, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Peter says he is coming back. Don't be so quick to dismiss the promise that he 
has made. Don't be so quick to dismiss or be casual about the scriptures. Do not shrug in indifference about the predictions that the prophets made. The word of God shapes our expectations, but it also reminds us that it governs the whole of history. And then Peter turns his attention away from the false teachers, away from the controversies. And he finishes this letter, I think, in a beautiful way where he focuses on God. He turns away from the personalities. He turns away from the heresy. turns away from the false teacher and he focuses on God. And I want to just share three things that he, that he shares about God as we close today. Very quickly. Three things. He says this. Do not overlook. Verse 8. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. And the first thing we see here about God that Peter reminds us is God's perspective. God's perspective. His perspective is different to ours. He says, do not overlook this fact that as the Lord... One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. He's quoting here of the Old Testament, uh, Psalm 90, verse 4, For a thousand years in your sight are as but yesterday when it is past. We are so governed by time. Aren't we? We we, 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 We were starting at 11 this morning. We didn't start about seven minutes past. That doesn't irk me at all, by the way. I don't... I get some sort of tick when we don't start on time. But... We're so governed by time. The kids have to be in school for a certain time. We, you know, you have to be at work for a certain time. You have to be here at a certain time. You have to do this at a certain time. God's not like that. God has different perspective than us. He's outside of time and space. And our perspective is if this doesn't happen by this time, then something. It's just not the case. He's outside of that. And he's not slow in delivering on his promises. We can't say to God that he's somehow slow in fulfilling his promises on Jesus' return because Jesus has not returned because the Father has not sent him. It's as simple as that. So the first thing we see is God's perspective is different than ours, but then we see that God's patience is different than ours also. Verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Is patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is patient with us. Amen. Nobody agree? Yes. God is patient with us. Really simple, straightforward question for us. How many of us deserve to be sitting here right now? Breathing this air. Enjoying the grace of company. How many of us deserve that? None of us. None of us. How many of us have sinned this, today already? Oh, no, you're lying. I'll tell you this every week. Why are you lying to me? All of us. All of us have sinned this morning already. And God is patient with us. Why has Jesus not returned yet? Because God's patient towards us. And Jesus will not return, folks. In all the controversy that's going on in the world at the moment, and all the things that you're listening to, and all the things that you're hearing, hear this. Jesus will not return until the full number of followers of Christ are brought in. The full number. He will bring all those whom he foreknew, all those whom he predestined before the foundations of the earth, he will bring them all to repentance and faith before he returns. That's why he has not returned yet. He is patient. He does not desire one to perish. Not one. 
He's patient. We offend him every day. We rebel against him every day. And he's patient. And if you're here with us this morning and you have not turned to Jesus yet in faith, repentance and faith, I plead with you again. Come to Jesus. Repent of your sin. Turn to Jesus in faith and come to him. God is patient. The final thing we see here is this. God has a plan. God has a plan. He has perspective. He's patient, but he has a plan. And this is his plan. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come. Like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. This is God's plan. Jesus will return. And he will return like a thief. Peter here is quoting the the New Testament actually here. Matthew 24. Do you not know on the day your Lord is coming? But you know this. That if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house to be bro- left his house to be broken into. I don't know if any of you ever have experienced a burglary. I'll just ask: Has anybody ever experienced a burglary in their house? Right? Okay, there's one or one or two. Right? I've never experienced it, but I've come close. For for many of you, you will know my father. He's the one driving around five different cars. And I promise you he's not a drug dealer. He's not. But he's the one driving around in several different cars. Right? One night, uh, the house was all asleep. I can't remember how many kids we had at the time, but everyone was sleeping. And what Bert decided he would do, Mom, would something happen, Mom? well and instead of picking up the phone to phone me and say John your mum's not well can you come to the house and I don't know how it happened but somehow we had given Bert a key at some stage that was never a good idea to begin with but the bold Bert decided he would just appear and so he let himself in sleeping he let himself in and he came up he walked up the stair he literally walked up the stairs and Julie was like there's something there's something in the house there's something in the house there's something in the house and I went to the door, opened the bedroom door, and Bert's standing in the hall. Now, he's never been as close to getting a dig. Ever. But, I can imagine the thief appearing in the night would give you a shock, just as Bert gave me a shock. But the word of God tells us this. Jesus will return like that. Like a thief in the night. No one knows. We could be sitting here now enjoying ourselves, enjoying this, enjoying each other, and Jesus could return. No one knows. I've quoted this before, but the Bible tells us that Jesus himself does not know. Only the Father knows. But he'll come like a thief. The sky will be split. And he will appear. Peter finishes with these words. He says this. Therefore, beloved. Since you are waiting for these. Be diligent. To be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. How do we do that? If he's going to come like a thief and no one will know, how are we to be found in this state? Simple. In Jesus. In Jesus. That's the only way. Because if he appeared now, 
in our human fallen state, would we be blameless, spotless? No, because you just all admitted to me there a minute ago that you all sinned this morning. But in Christ, in Jesus, we are without spot, without blemish, and at peace. So as a reminder today, just as I finish, the word of God should rule our expectations. The word of God, we should be reminded that the word of God has governed throughout history. And everything has come to pass as it should. We're reminded that God has perspective not like ours. He has patience not like ours. And he has a plan. And that plan is that Jesus will return for his bride, the church. Let me finish with this. Will you be found without spot, without blemish, and at peace? If you're not in Christ, you won't be. If you're not in Christ, you won't be. But if you are, praise God. If you're in Jesus, that's the way you'll be found. Praise him. Let me pray for us. Father, we do thank you so much for the, for the common graces that you've poured out on us today. Just being here, breathing, living. Father, we thank you for those things. But most of all, we thank you for Christ Jesus. And it is only in him, only through him that we can be found without spot or blemish and at peace with you. And so far, I pray for us. I pray for every single person who is under the sound of my voice. I pray that that's the way they would be found when you split the skies and when Christ returns. We love you. We thank you. And it is in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Uh, we're going to finish our time in, in as, as this part of our worship gathering. Uh, it, it's lovely to be able to say today that our worship gathering doesn't finish now. Like We worship as we converse with one another. We worship as we eat. We worship as we do everything we'll do this afternoon. But this part of And what we do, if you're visiting with us, we, we, we have communion in, in this part of our gathering. And if you if you were coming in, uh, you'll notice that, that, that the elements for communion were on the table. If you haven't got them and you want to take communion, they're over there. Please just nip over and get them. But how we do communion is, is we, well, Marcus is going to lead us in worship, sung worship. And just in this time, we have communion together. And so if you're a follower of Christ, if you love Jesus, have repented of sin and turned to him in faith, then you are welcome to have communion with us. And we just take it as we sing. And the purpose of this is to remember Jesus. Remember him. Remember his sacrifice. Remember his love for us. As I say, if you've trusted in him, come to faith in him, you're more than welcome. Please do take the time as we sing to repent of sin and then take communion together. If you're not a follower of Christ this morning, I, I lovingly ask that you don't take communion with us. Uh, it wouldn't make sense for you to do that. You'd be proclaiming something that you don't believe in. And so I lovingly ask that you don't take communion with us this morning. But if you want to talk about coming to faith in Christ, if you want to talk about Jesus, I'll be around all afternoon. Marcus will be around. Ali will be around. There'll be loads of people who are around who you can talk to about that. So please just do that. Uh, but let's come now. Let's worship. And let's have communion together. Do you want to stand? Let's stand together as we sing.